Great. Excellent. We are officially live and recording. And it's the Neuro Bro Show, episode 13, I think. Lucky Welcome 13. back, Russ. Welcome back to you. Thanks, From Mexico. Man. Yeah. How are you? So, for those who don't know, Russ had a hip replacement, what, a week ago? Whoa, not even. Five no, days. It was, it, was when, it was Wednesday. It was the 28th. I was home the next day. This is fantastic. Yeah. Walking so, with a walker the first day, walking with a now walking with a cane. It's amazing. I just I just blown away by this and I I'm happy about this. It's so good. So happy for this for you. I'm glad your pain level is low. How about uh, you know what I noticed on my hip replacement, even though I had a horrible post surgical pain from the surgery, but the pain that my hip was experiencing for years before that was completely gone and that felt so so nice yeah that's you good <clears throat> yeah this was a situation where i periodically got to points where um i still could have like low pain but it, it was it, it wasn't any way to live because the, the times when i had no pain no pain was when i didn't like my corrective exercise routine Let's see yep and then didn't do like a lot of sitting or anything. But for instance, on Monday before the operation, I had to go through all the preoperative appointments and I had to go into Manhattan. And there were, there were like, I saw like four different people getting up and down, sitting, laying down for, you know, and standing up for x-rays and, and all that kind of stuff like irritates it, you know, sitting. And so, so I, obviously that's something you do normally in life. So I couldn't, I can't, I couldn't live my life just, you know, constantly exercising and standing, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm so happy. Uh, I'm so happy that you're doing so well. And of course I had no, no doubts you do extremely well, but wow, man, this is great. Just, I, just, I just want to say well, hello to somebody here. So joining us on zoom mm -hmm. is my dear friend, Karina. Hola, Karina. Como esta mi amiga? It's good to see you. Uh, Thank you for joining us. Gracias. Uh, Practico mi español. Todos los días. So, Russ, uh, I love the topic you came up with today. Adaptation. And, man, you, w when you said, when you sent that yesterday, I started thinking about life. Adapting. And I, I'll just say this. Uh, recently, I was, here, here's just an idea, right? I was driving in this area not far from where I live. You know, and I'm driving, I'm looking around, I'm saying, man, you know, it's so different now than it was before. And the way it was before, it was that way for all of my life until maybe five years ago. And now this, this thing is this area, it, all the buildings have been knocked down. Because Carrier left, Carrier Corporation left the area. Um, the the General Motors plant that's gone to Miller. I mean, all this stuff. So all I can do is think about how pretty I thought it used to be, how nice I thought it used to be. Um, but it ain't that way anymore, and it's not going to go back to that, and it is what it is, and I have to accept that because I have no control over it. And so it puts me back into the mindset of be here now enjoy the moment mm -hmm. because it could change any moment and you yeah. won't get the moment again so take it in feel it be with it experience it love it if that's what you want to do with it and then remember it and then move forward because life only goes forward right it only goes forward if I die today, I mean, you know, I hope I don't, but if, if I keel over today, the world will not stop spinning. <laughs> and life will go on and uh, adapt. That's just one abstract thing that I think of often is this adaptation to change. Yeah. Any kind of change. <clears throat> so when you think about adaptation, what are you thinking about, Russ? Well, one thing I say about it is, uh, or... Or is it adapt? And I always get confused between adaptation and adaption. Is adaptation more of a, about when you do an adaptation of uh, 
uh, you know, something like when they talk about a, pl a, a play or something like that, or and then there's adaption. But um, anyway, whichever word you want to use, um, the reason I think it's such an um, important, powerful word is something I've been thinking about. Is, you know, one of my goals for this year is to try to um, <clears throat> bring on board more people who are like beginning exercisers or people who are hesitant. Uh, people who aren't taking ownership or being as proactive as they should. And, um, and I think understanding this concept, uh, concept of adaption and how it could, it's a two-way street, you could, you could do things that could foster uh, positive things in your life and your body and your brain, uh, in your environment, in your social surroundings. Um, and that's an adaption, but you could also do, uh, there's other things you could do that can make things go the other, go, go the other way and you could deteriorate and, um, and age quicker and all those kind of things. And I think part of the problem with people, um, you know, who maybe don't do as many proactive things is, is they just don't know the things that, could, that they could do. And some of them are simple just to cause your body to adapt positively and help you, you know, help you, help you uh, live better in this world, whether it's move better or whatever. And they also don't understand, you know, they don't understand the impact of uh, things that you could do that, that will negatively uh, make you deteriorate and how you could kind of, you know, nip that in the bud uh, and stop that from happening. So <clears throat> that's what makes me, you know, makes me think of, um, that it's an important concept to understand. And sometimes when we talk about exercise and everything, we give specific, you know, uh, demonstrations of things and we say, you know, do this and it'll help that. But I think sometimes it's good to take a step back and reflect on some sort of um, conceptual type of thing. So that's why I thought, you know, this was a, a good topic because uh, I like metaphors and things like that. So like we could even talk about things that really don't have anything to do with exercise. You know, like there's adaption that happens in the biological the living world where, you know, for instance, uh, for survival, uh, for instance, say there's a particular type of animal that, um, you know, survives on prey, but the prey is, is you know, almost, you know, just as fast as the, uh, the predator. So how do they adapt? So they, you know, at first maybe they maybe they tried to uh, catch the prey on their own, and then they learned uh, of its wolves or whatever. Then they learned that if they grouped together, uh, that they could they, they could catch the prey, you know, surround it or whatever. So that's that's adapt. That's you know that's an example of adaption. So um, yeah. when you know, when you learn about these and think about these things, you know, even if it doesn't apply directly like to exercise or anything like that, um, conceptually, if, if you think about these things, puts you in a certain frame of mind that makes you understand that you're impacted by your environment, you're impacted by what you do, you're impacted by what other people do to, you know, do, do to you, with you, um, all those things. So that's why I think it's a, I think it's a cool, cool topic. Uh, uh, you could adapt behavior, you know, it's not, again, just not like a physical thing, which, you know, affects your brain. So that's Absolutely. why I think it's a cool topic. And I have a bunch of notes. That Our dear friend Laura is with us. Laura, bienvenido. Hola, Laura. Estás, mi amiga. Uh, como fue, uh, well, I don't know how to say in Espanol. How was your trip? Los Angeles. She went with her family to Los Angeles oh. the past few days oh. to a wedding, I believe. So I'm glad you're with us, Laura. And again, Karina, bienvenido. Um, she asked Russ, how are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm, I'm just a little, mode. little sore. Um, you know, I, got, I just got to get my range of motion going. I'm walking with Walking with a cane, um, following my doctor's order. I, I have a fantastic surgeon, so uh, I got myself in trouble. Social media could be a little bit of a minefield. Uh, yeah. So I, you know, I've made lots of friends this year on social media, which is great. But some of them don't know that I'm a bit of a jokester. So <laughs> I made a post that uh, I, I 
requested to my surgeon a modified plan for my oh, recovery. I saw and that. I basically, yeah. yeah, basically it was it was Monday walk with a walker, Tuesday walk with a cane, Wednesday walk with walk without a cane, and by the time I got to the seventh day, I was running a five k, <laughs> and yeah. I got all these responses like follow your doctor's orders, <laughs> you know, don't uh, don't do that. Be careful. I, was, I, was, I had to tell them I was just joking, but. Going back to that, my 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 surgeon was great. Uh, he did a great job on the on the hip, and he's very strict. And I'm going to follow his his orders. It's basically just a few exercises and walking a little more each day for the first you know uh, month pl month plus. You know, first few months yeah. is going to go like that. That's um, great, man. That is fantastic. I, you know, I'll be a little impatient to do some of the more sure. You know, you know people stuff, like you and me, we, we want to get moving. Um, healing is well. I, right. I I had a question for you. Uh, so when we're speaking on the topic of adapting ad adaptation, I mean, you're you're living this. Laura is living this. Um, I'm well. I live it, but not with Parkinson's. You know, I'll just give you a quick story. So when I arrived in Singapore two years ago, this month, later in the month, um. I had to go to the hospital. I had massive, massive amount of blood clotting. It was very close to dying, like very close. But I'm really lucky I'm here. But it involved some changes. I had to change some things in my life. And so I've done well. I've done well since then. I keep finding things that help me to uh, uh, stay on track with relatively healthy dietary lifestyle you know his medications constantly adapting medications to my coumadin uh pt on inr levels but that's just one adaptation um what's another one i don't know cornea transplant but that's that's easy because i see really well now so my adaptation was really more so when i couldn't see as well the things i did to be able to function uh safely but when I think about uh, adaptation, there's so many uh, aspects this can go in. You can lose somebody in your life. You can gain somebody in your life. You can adapt either way. Specifically, though, uh, like what have you found as the most significant adaptations since you have had, let's say, any Parkinson's symptoms or diagnosis? And are you continuing... I know the answer to this, but I'd like it actually if you explain like how you continue to adapt to anything that is a challenge for you, whether it's movement, cognition, anything like that. What are your thoughts on that for you personally? What's your well, approach? That mindset? goes back to um, you know, not, you know, not everybody is uh, um, as geeky as I am about human movement, but. Um, that goes back to just having as many uh, tool, tool tools in your toolbox as possible So, I, and approaching things from multiple angles. So what I've learned about adapting, uh, the, simple, the simple version of adapting is that, that we could use is um, you know, weightlifting. It's very simple. Mm -hmm. You increase repetitions, you're, you increase the load, your, 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 your body, your muscles are going to adapt and you're going to get stronger. But now with Parkinson's, there's so many other things to learn, so many things that you could do. Uh, there's mindfulness. There's the fact what you talk about often, Carl, about outsourcing uh, the work to another part of the brain, you know, because uh, you've lost a skill that was normally like innate, like walking, and now you've got to retrain it. So what are the type of things you have to do there? So what I, I guess what I've learned is like the many ways to attack things and the alternative approaches. So then there's, a, there's another thing that I've learned too is that um, sometimes uh, to, to retrain and adapt, you have to do something specific. You know, whatever you're, whatever you're working on, the exercise or whatever is like, you know, specific and it looks specific to the symptom or whatever you're trying to fix. But sometimes... Sometimes not. Sometimes you uh, sometimes you have to take um, an indirect approach, and and that's again goes back to the learning where I've learned that there's certain things that you could do that traditionally I ne I never knew it would these types of things would help um, 
fix a certain problem. So take balance, for instance. You know, what's a traditional thing people think about balance and fall prevention is, you know, like standing on one leg, stuff like that. But I never knew about the vestibular system and your eyes and your eye tracking and how well you, you know, your, your, your field of vision is and how well your eyes move and muscle control in your eyes. So that's the way, that's another form of adaption where you don't, you can't do the, you don't, you can't do the, take the traditional approach to fixing the problem because it's not enough. You need a little assistance and you find out other things. Your body adapts by adding in other tools and other things to make that positive adaption happen. Right. Yeah. Um, well, I have so many different thoughts right now. I'm, I'm going to take a left turn here real quick, but another adaptation I experienced was as my hip became more and more, uh, you know, eroded in the acetabulum and the cartilage and things, it was really worn away and broken down before my replacement. My body adapted with all kinds of muscular imbalances and compensations. Uh -huh. So I adapted, but it wasn't in the necessarily a positive way. It was to avoid pain. You know, the, the body always wants to avoid pain. The brain wants to avoid pain. Welcome, Julie. Mm -hmm. Julie Whitehorn. Do you know Julie? Actually, she just she just friended me. I've 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 seen her on social media. I don't know if we're in a group together. If we're in a awesome. Parkinson's exercise group together, but I just accepted a request because I, I the oh, name looks familiar. But I just want to say, uh, welcome. Hi, Julie. When people nice show up. We appreciate it. We want to acknowledge that you're here, Karina. Laura, Julie, gracias. Um, yeah, so, I mean, that's a bad kind of adaptation, right? So your body will adapt physically. You don't even have to really think about it for it to do that. Um, but also, we may have to think about it when we're trying to readapt <laughs> to uh, improving movement, right? Cognition, brain outsourcing. I'm really, uh, I'm so fascinated how the brain and the body will, well, especially the brain, will adapt as needed. Yeah, so you talked about, um, yeah, like um, dysfunctional movement and the, 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 that could cause, I guess, what, what I call a negative adaption or adapting down. And that's a topic, again, when I was talking about people who are just being introduced to the world of movement uh, dysfunction and, and movement disorders. Uh, is that they may not realize uh, some of the things that they do um, that could cause what, what I call downward adaption. And I'll just mention two right now off the top of my head. One is just um, you, st you start losing a skill and your reaction, um, instead, instead of taking a proactive reaction, your reaction is, is that I have a movement disorder I'm having more and more trouble getting up from the chair. Uh, my assumption is that eventually I won't be able to get up from a chair. And that's what I want people to understand is it's, it's, it's hard when you start feeling that, but also at the same time, it's a lot easier than you think to reverse that, especially if you do it when it first starts happening. Yeah. And um, you could do preemptive adaption too, before you even, if you know the certain types of problems that people with Parkinson's have. If you're, if you, if you've been diagnosed with Parkinson's, you still, you still walk well, get the heck walking. You, you should be walk, you should be walking to preemptively strike that you don't get dysfunctional walking. Think about how lucky you are to yeah. have been, you know, you're if, walking is like one of the primary things, you know, that, that us people with Parkinson's don't like because, you know, when it starts going down, you get that shuffle gait, you get freezing, you start getting nervous about falling. So think about how lucky you are. If you've been diagnosed with Parkinson's and you still walk well, get out there and walk. You just walk and don't stop. So that's like preemptive adaption. But the other thing I was talking about is it's, you, you do get an indication that things are going bad. You know, people don't realize how easy it is to, to turn around. I mean, um, I, I've, I've covered this topic, exercise snacking, where I did a presentation, you know, on one of our shows, which is basically going throughout the day and doing little bouts of exercise 
Um, and sometimes they're tied into daily tasks of living. Sometimes it's just a regular traditional exercise, but just fitting in in a short time frame. Um, so associated with daily tasks of living, for instance, what I mentioned, getting up and down from a chair, you, you can still do it. When you sit down for breakfast, sit down, stand. And every time you sit down or get up from a chair, just do one additional. So you sit down, then get up and get down again and then have your breakfast. And when it's time to get up, stand up, sit down and get up again, and then walk to go to wherever you're going. You do that, you'll, you'll probably get an additional 20 or you know so up and downs um, during the day. You've, you've, you've taken <laughs> 10 seconds out of your schedule to do that, and you're avoiding adapting down. Right. I, see, that's one of the things I love about the exercise snacking concept that you have is taking uh, a lot of times taking everyday activities and turning them into something that will benefit somehow, maybe balance, strength, whatever. You know, the sit to stand is probably the first and most common exercise that we see in the PT world for people who have trouble. Well, let's say, you know, in order to have good balance, you must have certain amount of strength so the more you lose strength you will lose balance just how it works right so sit to stand especially if you can crush like this not use hands for support that's ideal it's a great exercise it's kind of like doing squats work on the legs work on the strength but um i love that so, so mm -hmm. um so i wanted to mention the said principle too Carl. In, in the book my book russ wrote for a chapter about uh, chapter eight, exercise snacking, stick stick to itiveness. You know things you can do. You don't need a gym. You just use stuff around your house or use your body. It's great, and you're always coming up with new stuff too. That's one thing I really like. It's fun, um, and I want to do. I want to start um, now that hopefully things are settling down a little bit. You know, with my operation, hopefully the COVID stuff will calm down. And, things will start coming together. I want to start doing more with the um, exercise snacking, like do challenges again to target the people who are more like beginners and um, people who are having trouble coming up with things to help them move better or getting going on exercising or they don't like exercising. Because like I said, the, this the kind of thing I just mentioned there with the stay, sitting up and down, it doesn't really put that much strain on your life or it doesn't really force you to do any major exercise, you know, workout type stuff. Um, it would be good to work up to that, but this is a good starting point. Um, there's the other half of, you know, we were on this topic of negative adaption, you know, and then preemptively, uh, you know, um, attacking it. There's another um, piece that, that, that kind of is a little bit of gray area, but, when you're having problems, sometimes you need assistance. So assistance could be in the form of, uh, you know, you were able to walk on your own. Now you need to walk with a walker or a cane. Assistance could be something hurts and you need a brace. Uh, yep. some, something like that. Or you need the help of a person. So um, <clears throat> one thing on that too, that um, I, I would hope people would change their mindset on is that try your best to make in a lot of these cases assistance a temporary thing um, another example is the agility dots right carl we use the agility dots to walk yep. you walk on these dots on the floor and it helps increase your stride it helps smooth out your your walking uh it, it um, simplifies the task of walking and it helps you with better form but eventually you, you don't, you don't want to keep looking down at the dots. You want to look straight ahead. Eventually you want to get rid of the dots and hopefully be able to walk normally without the assistance right. of the target. So that's another example. But so um, in the sitting to standing, an example of assistance, which I would try to resist is um, a, again, there's this reaction when something first starts happening, the assumption is that you're not going to be able to do it. So people go out and buy these chairs, you know, that, that prop you up, you know, that, that make you stand up, you know, they, mm -hmm. you hit a lever and then it pops up the cushion oh, and it pushes, yes, yeah, pushes your buttocks up. 
So now what you've caused is, you know, you've caused negative adaption because you've, you've stopped your own, you know, uh, your own musculature from doing it. And just like the, 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 uh, this, this, this mechanical chair is pushing you up. Um, you could use that, you know, to help you get going, but there's other ways to do that as well. What I tell people is if they can't go, go down all the way to a chair, put a bunch of cushions on the chair and then sit down and up on like a higher, like a higher chair. Yeah. Um, so something like that. Um, excuse me. You know, you bring up so many valid points. Um, for example, uh, (laughs) this is a real simple example of adapting, but recently my bank changed their app. You know, I had to adapt. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Out. how am i going to pay some bills now i'm going to transfer money and things like that it's not a big deal but that's an adaptation too sure it drives me nuts when uh sometimes when i have to relearn something i've been using for a couple of years a certain way and i'm in a hurry and i'm okay let's just, ah i can't do it i don't have time so i have to go back and learn later adapting but i i, th- I think that uh so, sometimes this whole thing about adapting can be frustrating because I, I know that I love to keep doing things the way I've been doing them pretty much because it's just easier that way. Well, look However, at COVID. <laughs> I, I appreciate, though, and I do strive to learn to do things in a new way uh, or learn to do things differently. I think a couple of things I've been working on lately is when I write to write more succinctly say word more with less words less fluff you know and also when i speak i just want to be succinct i'm re-recording all the stuff on the online institute because basically i was a talking head when i did it two three years ago i can say all of it in half the time and i can say more that's an adaptation of making this choice a lot of times this adaptation seems to be a choice of well the power of your will right Mm -hmm. how much do you want to adapt or do you want to challenge yourself to adapt lately i look at everything as a challenge uh, especially if it has to do with my brain challenging myself raising the bar working it and then taking a nap yeah, and, and adapting is also about adapting. What, what's your goal in adapting? Adapting to live life better, or to avoid to avoid mm. stress, or, or whatever it is. So, I mean, there's even behavioral societal adaption. You know, like in a society, you live in a society that has laws, that has rules, that has social um, customs, and it's different all around the world. Changes may happen in your world, like we've had in the past year with with covid oh yeah uh, you have to adapt huge we've you been have to make forced societal. into adapting yeah we forced you have to make social adaptions there how you interact with people how you accept or not accept we won't get into the politics but how you accept or not accept wearing a mask or getting a vaccination that's yeah. all that's all personal adaption things and you're going to adapt to the way that you know you know, most people are going to adapt to the way they, you know, feel is going to benefit them the most. The mm-hmm. thing they think that makes sense. Um, but again, that's sometimes it's obvious, and sometimes it's sometimes it's not. So, getting to exercise, um, Carl and I know this term from uh, NASM and any anybody else who's taken a, a curriculum in, uh, in in movement. The said principle, S A I D, and that says that the human body adapts specifically. That's the S um, to adapt to uh, imp- That's the A to adapt to impose demands, and that's the I D. So that just means that the demands or challenge you or your body or whatever or whatever it is, um, your body. He's going to you know, adapt to that and hopefully, hopefully you know, in, in the case of uh, us people with Parkinson's in a, in a positive way, you have to understand what you need to do. And sometimes, um, you know, the saying here says specifically adapts to impose demand. Sometimes the exercise is kind of specific. Uh, if you're, if you want to make your bicep bigger and you do a bicep curl, that's kind of 
pretty precise. But um, sometimes, like I was talking about before, there's indirect kind of things. You want to improve your balance. Yeah, you stand on one foot. But you might want to do visual vestibular exercises. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, it's important to know how do you how do you foster positive adaption? How do you do how do you do the the challenges? You know, challenge me. Challenge equals change as far as uh, you know, movement and um, improving um, Parkinson's symptoms go. So you need to challenge yourself. So how do you do that effectively? Um, so you're putting the right demands on your body, on your physiology, and uh, and not put it, not doing the wrong things. So uh, that's where like nutrition and those kind of things come in. There's there's a that physiological adaptation. You put the wrong things into your body, your body adapts by sometimes by freaking out, <laughs> yeah, true. Uh, yep. with the, you know, inflammation, those kind of things. So it's important to understand how that impacts your, uh, your health. So, um, you know, and, and there's all sorts of ways we could, we could um, stimulate change, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's, I just said stimulate, whether it's like stimulating the nervous system, like we do with the uh, walking barefoot, or, or using vibration, uh, whether it's um, challenging our mus musculature, neuromuscular with strengthening, uh, fast motion, slow motion, mindful mindfulness. That's another thing. Um, learning to learning part of learning to adapt is is also understanding as far as movement goes. Understanding the way you move and figuring out ways to get around it. So. Um, one of the things I've been trying to work out in my mind to uh, try and uh, come up with a way of explaining how to mindfully overcome certain daily tasks of living is kind of like breaking it down, almost like a sport movement. So um, people lose fine motor skills and they move, lose uh, daily tasks of living. And if you think of, I think of certain things that I've overcome, I've overcome them mindfully. And the way I've done it is breaking it down almost like a sports movement. So putting on a shirt, putting on a jacket, if you have bradykinesia, what happens is uh, say I'm putting on a jacket, you put one sleeve in and you got to do this thing and get the other hand around. Yeah. With bradykinesia, if you let bradykinesia take control, you go like this. And then what's supposed to happen is you move this other arm quickly and go like that. But the the Brady kinesia, if the Brady kinesia takes has anything to say with say with it, um, you're going to go slow and that sleeve's going to drop down and you're going to miss it or whatever. So yeah. if you break it down like a like like a sports movement, you know, like for instance, like throwing a pitch, there's the there's the the wind up, the gather, and then the actual power movement, and then the follow through. So if you think of something like that. I'm going to put this arm in out. Now I know I got to, I got to make up for that bradykinesia. Now I got to get that other arm around quick. So if you mindlessly do that, you could overcome um, Parkinson's, you know, certain Parkinson's sy symptoms tied sure. into daily tasks of living. So my advice, um, you know, for people out there who are having those kind of problems, folding clothes, uh, you know, all, all sorts of different um, daily tasks of living. Um, try and break break it down uh, when you're trying to do it and observe observe what's happening and try to break it down into like almost like separate steps and you might find that you just need to whatever your symptom is you may need to overcome it by going with extreme focus so tying your shoe you know you have there's one part where you go kind of slow where you wrap around but then there's that other thing where you actually tie the tie the uh tie the knot and you yeah. have to be big and you have to be fast and you have to be also be pre precise to thread everything through so work on that work on that one piece at a time work on the loop part you know getting that around quick um and yeah so it's, really it's an intentional yeah specific focused attention mindful attention to like achieving something a certain way yeah, and that's that's an adaption as well because now you're actually you have to adapt the way you move. Mm -hmm. um, you have to add in that mindfulness. Um, yeah, 
the, you know, the, I was I had so many different thoughts. It's a really interesting topic. Um, but I was thinking that you brought up something earlier that's kind of interesting. Um, when people set a goal, let's say, even if it's just tiny, they might do it uh, uh, in a couple of different ways. One of them is, like, for example, I know a gentleman who grew up very, very, very poor. I mean, economic means impoverished horribly. And he is a multi, 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 multi millionaire now. What happened was he he moved away from, in his mindset, he tells me that it wasn't that he was moving towards getting money. It was he was moving away from being poor. So he had an uh, away from motivation, whereas somebody else may look and say, I'm going towards this. Some people are, are fearful of certain things, so fear will drive them to achieve something as they move away from which that which they fear, while other people, the fear is really not the issue, it's the excitement of something. And I've always been right in the middle, you know. I'm so in the middle with this. There are things that I want to move away from that I've moved away from the way my life used to be many decades ago. And I do move towards certain, th I especially move towards Mexico <laughs> because it's <laughs> honestly... It's the only country I want to go to. Well, I, there are a couple in South America I'd like to visit too. But I love Mexico. I love the people of Mexico. That's where I want to go. So I'm definitely moving towards Mexico when I think about going to Mexico. I want to go to Bolivia. I want to go back to Argentina. I'd like to go to Chile. Um, I'm not moving away from the United States. I'm moving towards other countries. Does that make any sense? Because, I mean, uh, that that's an actual pull for me to go to certain other countries. I, I am driven towards those places, and it always has to do with the people. Whereas uh, I will say, and I just won't say where, there are certain places I will not go, even in my own country. Because I'm not driven to go towards those places or the people. Oh, your you goal should be to be comfortable, right? And comfortable and happy. That's kind of a universal goal. And yeah. um, having, an envi having an environment, I guess, where you, back to the adaption thing, having to, have to live in an environment where you constantly have to adapt and adapt maybe in a way that you don't like. Mm -hmm. um, your freedom is limited or whatever the reason, or, 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 it's, or it's, you have to uh, hang out with people, people you don't, you don't care for, who aren't caring and have the same values as you, whatever those adaptions are, the physical environment, uh, you live somewhere where there's a lot of pollution or bad things oh, physically true. that you don't like. And, um, you know, there's via, there's very, and, you know, you talk about rich and poor and there's, there's actually some areas, there's a lot of areas of the world most beautiful areas of the world aren't necessarily uh, rich. That's for sure. Sometimes when there's too much money, there's too much over overgrowth. So it's yeah, true. That doesn't even uh, those things don't even go hand in hand. But um, yeah, uh, th those. Th that's why I like sometimes taking a step back. You know, we're exercise geeks, but taking a step back and just thinking of these topics where you could start drawing um, comparisons to something more than just exercise, just to life, society, um, making metaphors to, you know, uh, how nature behaves, you know, other, other living organisms. Um, there's, it's all, you know, we even have time, how we, how we live our life and adapt even has times, not even just to other, mammals and and other uh living moving things but even just like something like plants you know plants mm -hmm. adapt they have to set down roots you know we need a strong foundation they need nutrition they need sunlight we, we need all those things too you know so um so, it's it's fun so, kind of making all those analogies. yeah that's really interesting uh 
in my yard I have this this beautiful these beautiful tulips. So picked three. They're in a little vase by the kitchen sink. Um they are wide open right now. Wide open. Because there's a window right there, the sun comes in, and they just, they're going to take in the sun. At 8 o'clock at night, they're closed. Mm -hmm. I never even thought about it, but they have adapted, you know? So interesting. Yeah, so um, we're kind of like on a philosophical thing here. So I, I'll, I, uh, some of you know I like to write poems. So if you don't mind, maybe I'll, I'll read uh, this one I have. It's about plants, kind of how it ah, is. Por favor, yeah. Please. So, um, and it was part of a social media post. So it goes, uh, when I woke up this morning, I started to think about plants. Why plants? I have no idea, but it went into my, it went into my, I went with my thoughts and I wrote this. So this is called Keep the Garden Growing. Although plants don't walk or talk, no laughs nor, nor cries, there's much we can learn from them in my eyes. When water is scarce, plants stretch their roots. We buckle, we buckle down and pull up our boots. When dark clouds persist, plants reach for the sun. We strive to be positive and bring back the fun. We both feed on nutrients to, till we get our fill, but too much or too little and we become ill. We share the same earth, land, water, and air. Let's treat it all better to show that we care. When placed in a pot, a plant gets confined. Its roots go in circles and we can get in a bind. No sharing of food, soil, or water. It takes what it's given, sometimes more than it ought to. When humans restrict their world, live by greed and excesses, it means suffering and hate and so many messes. When challenged, we must adapt and learn. Dig your roots deep, wide for the life that you yearn. When days dark, when dark days persist, we know it's not fun. Stay positive, stand tall, reach for the sun. Remember the world's not confined to your tiny pot. Branch out, see all the colors. You might like it a lot. That's great, man. You've got so, a knack for that, brother. It's great. So we could even, you know, draw analogies to plants. They're not moving things, but they need nutrients. Mm -hmm. They could run into problems based on their environment. You put them in a pot, you don't put them in a bigger pot. They just start going around in circles and, 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 and living a confined life. And eventually they'll, they'll go root bound and die. Yep. So you yep. don't want to, you don't want to adapt down. You want to, you know, you want to, you want to reach out your roots and figure out how to do that, learn how to do that. And, and ask for help. That's a that's the thing. There's um, there's such a big community out there, and uh, I see more and more uh, ways uh, people people starting whether they're starting up social media groups or group classes to help people with Parkinson's. There's so many ways to approach this. Reach out to those people. It's fun. Uh, you get to meet other people. You get to learn from them. You get to try new things. Uh, the more options there are out there, the more possibilities there are for people who haven't gotten started. It's great. It's great, great world out there, limitless world to explore. You know, um, oh, Chris Garcia. Bienvenido, Chris. Como estas, mi amiga? Chris was with me in um, Oaxaca. She came to attend and um, she's somebody you'll be seeing more of she's based in mexico city she's amazing and uh, she does a lot of uh, let's see psychotherapy for people let's see elderly and people with movement disorders so we're we are nobody knows but now you know we're going to be incorporating her into our team because i don't see all of us necessarily traveling to mexico a whole lot I'll probably do the most of it. Although I'd love for you to go with me. Soon yeah, that's and awesome. Often. Uh, but Chris is going to be with us in the future. That's great. And uh, she's great. I love her. Well, empowerment's a great thing. I mean, you can't um, <laughs> we you can't travel all over the place, Carl. You're not. Uh, you know, we can't. We could clone you. That would be good. But um, 
yeah, if we can empower the people in those different locations and yeah. continue the sharing and uh, learning. Uh, Chris, como se dice en español? I met you uh, maybe November 2018. Uh, era uh, un taller en Ciudad de México. Um, so we were at a workshop in Mexico. She came and, and I knew when I saw her, I knew this person is special, muy especial. Um, grande corazón. Um, hermosas, um, a spirit, uh, a spirit. She's a great person with a great heart, great spirit. She likes to help people. And we have written each other a lot. And so I finally got to see her for a few days. And uh, uh, we did a lot of exchanging of phones with Google Translator and reading what each other wrote, but it was great, right? Google <laughs> Traductor. See, Chris? <laughs> Muy divertido. <laughs> But it was great, so you'll be seeing her more. She's, she's great. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, I want to adapt by teaching more people how to teach other people and help people. Uh, one of the things that I was thinking though is in Oaxaca, again, once again, just like in Austin and all these other places you've been with me and you know Markham, Ontario, you deliver a concept, you you demonstrate an example, and then you say, okay, go, and then people come up with stuff. And what I noticed in Oaxaca, and it could be partially the language barrier, although Laura is the best translator, period. I mean, she was stellar in her delivery of material and her ability to engage people. She's so good at this. Thank you, Laura. Um, what I noticed is people were doing things, let's say, wrong, yet what is wrong and i'm looking i'm thinking wait a minute that's not wrong that's different in fact it's probably better than what i had in my mind so i i took out of that i took out more ideas and i love it man so what basically what i found uh, is six years ago when i started doing this i had a certain idea in mind of what things should be like and the more i deliver teach but more so way more so learn the more i realize as i've adapted no pun intended but seriously adapted my mindset is i actually don't really know that much i mean yeah so maybe i know a lot but we're, when it really comes down to it it almost seems like there's an infinite amount of information to know just about the subject of helping people to move better parkinson's or not change the brain cognition I mean, the sky's the limit, man. And it, it's like limitless, like another topic we could probably talk about. I'd love to talk about. It's one of your words you use, and I love it. Uh, it, says it, it says that on one of your shirts, limit, limitless, is that the more I know, the less I feel I know. Mm -hmm. And I'm completely open to adapting to not knowing much so that I can learn more and know more, <laughs> if that makes any sense. <laughs> You know, yeah. I mean, that whole the limitless thing. The 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 other term I like is you know thinking outside the box. Yeah. Because um, and this 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 um this this topic has been you know brought up in recent years about Parkinson's. Are we even? Are we? Have we all these years been barking up the wrong tree? Is the solution for Parkinson's really? something completely different than the direction a lot of the researchers are going with types of medicines they're they're trying to make and solu mm -hmm. so solutions so you always want to think outside the box i mean you think of the great inventors who've come up with things that worked um they didn't know you know they didn't know it was going to work they just they just guessed but if they if they only tried things that they knew about and learned about in school they, we would have never had, you know, these great, great inventions. Um, you know, you know, as a trainer, Carl, probably some of the coolest things you've had your client do is those things where you're like, oh, let's do this. And then all of a sudden you see great things happening. And it was something you just yeah. kind of made up or a modification of something you had learned or, or whatever. 
and I know my favorite story is um, I successfully had a client with um, muscular uh, muscular dystrophy um, MS, mm-hmm. multiple sclerosis, um, who couldn't li- who could only lift his foot three inches off the ground. By the end of the first session, I had him raising his his knee all the way up to you know parallel to floor. Wow! And that was just it was just I came up with some I rigged up something I was just a, a guess, and that change actually became permanent. So who knows? Wow! If I had just tried traditional you know training therapy things, it's that wouldn't have happened. Yeah, yeah. Well, this goes into another area that I wrote about in the book, which. Um... The things that we, I, well, you said, so part of this is what I wrote, but part of it's uh, what I'm going to say is something you put into my mind is we need to be our own test labs. You are your own test lab. You're trying things all the time. So I don't want us, as I was writing in the book about being restricted by evidence-based stuff all the time, because if you only do evidence, well, it might not be bad, but maybe you are your own researcher. I mean, I've been told by researchers that we should be our own researchers and create our own, our own evidence. Because technically, if you do something that has, let's say you do a concept or a technique that's never been written about, which is probably pretty hard to actually do, but you don't know about it at least, and you haven't found that research, or maybe it's non-existent, but you deliver something and it works, your proof is right there mm-hmm. may not work for every person because of how they are. You know, I've, I've really uh, recently learned that it's important for me when I do word lists, I do word lists with people. So every week we add on new words. I want short term mem- memory to become long term with our word lists. I started it a few weeks ago. So now we're up to like 15 words, you know, walk in the door. Hey, how's it going? Hey, Give me the words. Give me an order. I want them in order. For Maybe if they can't do it in order. They do it in any order. And I keep track of which ones they get. They're in groups of three, so they're easy for me to remember if they miss a word uh, or to point out if they miss a word. But also, uh, some people, when we go over the words, they're auditory learners. So you say the word, they're going to remember. Um, other people, I get the iPad and images. Might not be the actual word written out. Images, yeah. tomato. You know, a little more visual. And so they're visual learners, <clears throat> or maybe a combination. Well, that made a whole lot of difference when I started showing images. And so I guess my long-winded uh, point here is that you could deliver a concept that works for one person, but might not be this for the other person, even though they have the same issue and the same goal. So we need to adapt on communication and cueing. Mm-hmm. So that they can make their adaptation to do something that they couldn't do when they walked in the door. I, it's like I, uh, pretty interesting stuff. Yeah, and I had a thought on what you said about the research-based stuff. Um, it's interesting um, because a lot of times what I say is um, <clears throat> I'm on a couple of um, social media groups, Facebook groups that talk about Parkinson's research and I normally only chime, I chime in on the movement stuff. I don't, I'm not really an expert on the physiological, biological, medication, chemical stuff, but on the human movement stuff, I'm like, guys, the research is already out there. It's just that you're now you're talking about Parkinson's, but human movement is a science. Yeah. And, and there is already evidence, evidence based. So do we do, I didn't need it. I, I guess I guess these re- re- research results are for the benefit of people who want to know what the options are. Now I could go out there and try because I know it helps Parkinson's. But I, I didn't need anybody to tell me that tango dancing was good for balance and good for um, you know um, fighting Parkinson's symptoms because I know that um, because I because I know what what tango entails it entails moving turning in in quickly uh, in different directions exchange of weight slowly stepping on and turning rotating onto one foot all those things the research is there it's 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 basically like athletic training um 
athletic training is pretty much similar to Parkinson's training, except, um, you know, maybe add in some of like the cognitive stuff, which is, mm -hmm. which is actually starting to become popular with athletes now anyway. It is. But yeah. what you I tell people is, oh, I got, I got a personal trainer. They, sometimes they say, oh, I have a personal trainer, but they don't know Parkinson's. And I just, I just say, if they know how to train an athlete, they, they, you could, you could, they could have you do the same things and then if they know how to modify and adapt exercise, have them you do the same things an athlete would do, just modify them because an athlete needs to move quicker. So does a person with Parkinson's. An athlete needs good balance. An athlete needs to react. And all those things, the difference is the athlete's already at a high level. They want to go higher. And a person with Parkinson's, you know, is, is has a diminished, that skill is diminished and they need to go higher. But it's the same thing. Yeah. So the research is there. Which brings me, uh, reminds me of something I say all the time, and some people laugh at me, but I honestly don't really care. People with Parkinson's are people too. I only say that because there are people out there who allow a diagnosis of anything, cancer or whatever, to define them. And that's actually 100% fake news. You aren't your cancer. You aren't your MS. You aren't your heart transplant. You're a person. You aren't your Parkinson's. You live with it. Um, I have to do a hard stop in two minutes. Okay. Um, I want to tell people, first of all, it's my new email signature. Keep moving and keep learning. You got to use the body, use the brain every day. Get started because if you don't feel like it, but you get started with whatever it is you're needing to start or you should start, let's say movement, you probably get the energy to keep going. Same thing happens to me when I do my taxes. I put it off, and I put it off, and I put it off. This year I did them early. It was easy this year. I didn't have travel last year. No international income, really. Done. Three hours. Just had to get started. <laughs> and come back and see us next Monday. We don't know the topic yet, but we'll figure it out. Yeah. Stop by on Thursday this week at 10 a.m. Eastern Time because I'll be with Laura uh, as my amazing translator. And we have a special guest, Alfredo Bozzieri, who's a gentleman, I believe, early, mid-40s, lives with Parkinson's for 15, 16 years. And on World Parkinson Day, April 11th, he climbed the third highest mountain <laughs> in North America. So he's going to tell about tell us about the challenges and the thrills of that day. He's our guest this Thursday. Uh, if you don't see these shows, if you're not able to join us live or on Zoom, they're all recorded. And every time I, like tonight, I will post this episode in YouTube and post on uh, my Facebook page. And then just go to the link and you'll see it's in the playlist of all the other shows for this and then i have another playlist for the show with laura and me in spanish uh, i had one quick thing to add on my end yep just take a few seconds um you mentioned it was world parkinson's day and world parkinson's month so i made a pledge this year to be a good advocate and i posted on facebook every day every day something yeah. that had to do with uh parkinson's awareness so you can see all those posts. If you, I just did a hashtag PD awareness RP. So if you search on Facebook on PD awareness, my initials RP, all one string, you'll see all my posts. And uh, hopefully there'll, there'll be some things in there that resonated with you. There's a few fun things towards the end when I had my hip operation, I just kind of winged it. Um, no, they're great it, posts though. They're really good insights, perspectives, uh, inspiration. I, I love the posts. And some of it's good for people with Parkinson's. Some of it's good for people who knew nothing about it before. And, 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 and then, then they, then they learn what it's all about. So I hope, yeah, I hope you enjoy those and my music videos and my fun music videos. And they uh, that's a great, great video yeah. too. Great. Video. I think that was week day 16 or something. I don't know. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, we got to thank you from Julie. Julie, thank you too. Really appreciate you joining us. You joining us. Uh, are we connected Julie on Facebook? If not, send me your request. I don't always remember who I'm connected with, um, but please, if we're not, send me a request. Uh, so I want to thank you. Well, I'll get to you last because it's going to save you for last. Laura, Karina, Chris, and others who are here who I can't see, Julie, 
thanks for joining me but more than more than anything without you doing this russ it's not the same so thanks to russ and best wishes you, to you always thanks. my neuro bro and your hip and recovery and you're crushing it man i love you man you're the best we'll have to we'll have to get together soon now and do some uh hell some yeah work together Shit. sorry i swore up. but yes <laughs> All right, I've got right. her out. Got to meet with somebody. She's ninety years old and she kicks my butt, and I can't wait to see her. So, uh, you know, I get motivated by everybody who I work with, but this lady's exceptional, sharp as a tack, cognitively, and she's crushing it. Ninety, ninety years old. Time to go and get my butt kicked. Okay. All right, keep moving, keep fighting, everybody. Yep, keep moving. Use your body, use your brain every day. Just get started. You get the energy to keep going. See you next Monday, ten a.m. Thanks, Russ. Anytime. I enjoy Adios it. Adios. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.